In this video, I'm going to be showing you a very simple process for not only making multiple styles of picture frames with multiple finishes, but how to frame made artwork or artwork that you find as well. So a few years ago, someone gave me these two books. One of them is a Courier and Ives book with old um, lithograph prints. And I ruined this book, as you could see in the video, by cutting out the binding which is simply just cutting all those strings that are binding the book together. And then um, you, can, you can have single leaf pages. And I'm going to be framing these prints and probably be trying to sell them as well. So once you have all of those um, strings out, there's, there were two staples in this one. I removed the staples and then you'll see you won't have to rip pages or cut pages out of the book. The second book is called A Widow and Her Friends, and it's ink drawings from um, 1901. I actually had to Google this one because I wasn't super familiar with it, and that one was already fairly torn apart, so I, that, I didn't have to tear that book apart. And then the lithograph print book, there was a dotted line, you can't really see it in the video, um, that was a mark for the binding, and I just cut that off, and then you're left with a nice shaped print. So these two prints are different sizes. They're off by a fraction, so I'm going to have to make different size frames. I'm going to be using multiple materials because I'm going to test out potentially selling these. So the first one, uh, one of the materials I'm using is reclaimed molding, which is nice because I get it mostly for free. So I have a sacrificial fence um, attached to my real fence on my table saw and a dado stack in there, and I'm ripping um, my board some rabbits into the edges of these moldings. Standard rabbit width for picture frames is about a quarter of an inch. I made mine a little bit wider and the depth I kind of just eyed the depth based on the thickness of the moldings because they're not standard. So these were about three eighths inch to a half inch deep. And then another material I'm using for the picture frames, I didn't film it, is old um, wood flooring. A handyman I know gave me this stuff not that long ago. I use this for all kinds of stuff. This is oak. Um, it's great for picture frames because it pretty much has an instant rabbit in it. Now I cut the rabbit on the pieces I'm using because I already had my, my jig set up for it. So you can see I cut that. But if you are just using this flooring, you could cut off this bottom part of your tongue and you have an instant rabbit and then you can just rip off the tongue on the bottom part of this groove and then you get an instant rabbit and then you could just rip off the tongue and you're left with this nice oak um, framing material. Now you could also decide to do it since these ridges are kind of uniform you could have this uh, this side facing forward as well. I decided to just use the flat stuff. Now I got this because um, pre-finished wood flooring is pretty much what everybody's using. This is unfinished, so he didn't want it anymore and he gave it to me. So that is a, you could usually find this stuff on sale or people don't want it and that is another great option for picture frames as well. Then there's a pretty simple formula that um, someone told me about in order to get these cuts perfect every time. Um, if you think you can just cut a miter based on this length, which is what I first assumed when I started making, making picture frames. You cannot because you have to account for the thickness um, not only of your material but also the rabbit. So what you're going to do is you're going to measure your frame, your length, your width, and get that number. So since I'm doing two different sizes, I did it for two different sizes. So for the bottom one, across the top it's 15 and a half. You're adding a sixteenth to all those dimensions for play, so that is fifteen and nine sixteenths. For the top and bottom, it was a little over three quarters, so with a sixteenth added, it came to about eleven and seven eighths. So now for this one, I'm going to be using this older lumber. You're finding the thickness of your lumber minus the rabbit. So for me, that was two and a half. You're multiplying that by two and that's going to give me 5. I'm going to take that 5, add it to this number, and get new numbers for both, both measurements. And then this number is going to be the measurement you're going to cut your top and bottom pieces to, and this one will be the two sides. And by cut, I mean these are the total lengths of the pieces, and then you'll put a 45 on them so the inside portions will be smaller. But these are the pieces you're cutting to. So in my shop, um, I do have a chop saw, but it's not going to cut those 45s perfectly accurate. 
Um, so cutting a 45 on the radio arm saw is also not perfectly accurate. So I'm going to rough cut all of my pieces using these dimensions. So I'll probably cut that one to 21, this one to 17, and then on my table saw with my cross cut sled, I'll cut the 45s. So if I want to make the frames using this stuff, this measurement is only an inch and a half. So times two, I would be adding three to these measurements versus five. And then my last molding was the thickest, so I ended up adding six and a quarter to my original measurements. So all of these cuts can be made on a chop saw, which is what most people I'm imagining are gonna have, but I choose to do it on my table saw because they're just super highly accurate. So like I said, I'm rough cutting everything on the radial arm saw. And then I have these, these miter jigs that fit onto my cross cut sled. And it's really simple. I just use a, um, a quick square to get those lined up so they cut a perfect 45. And once that's in place, I could cut all of my pieces. So before I cut my final pieces, I always do a test cut once I have everything set up and make sure that that's cutting a perfect 45. And then I'm good to go. So I'm pretty sure at some point or another we've all been victims of cutting those miters on the wrong sides um, of the piece. So for the first round I always cut them upside down with the rabbit facing away from me. So I get a nice clean 45. Then I measure from the tip of that router to the measurements I need on all my pieces and cut a new line um, that I gauge up to the saw and then cut all those pieces. Now it would be much easier to cut those original 45s and then set a stop and cut all these pieces identically but I since all of these were every single frame was a different size it would have been more annoying to set up a stop for everything than it would be to just hand cut them using the mark as a guide so that's what I did but if I was even using these on a, ch on a chop saw you could set up a, um, a stop and, and if you're making multiples, cut all the pieces much quicker. But that's why you'll see in the video I'm cutting each different type of molding. There's two reclaimed types of molding and then the oak. So I'm doing everyone, everyone singularly. And you can see that rabbit is facing away from me and the molding's upside down for those original cuts. Then I'm making my marks and um, flipping the molding to the right side and cutting all those miters. I always make sure they're the exact size before I test fit them because if these are off even fractionally, um, your frame will have gaps in it. And then this is the last molding, so same process. So I'm going to go through it pretty quickly. And this molding is, is fairly f uh, plain. It just has a little bit of a curve at the edge. But I got this out of someone's house. They were um, redoing their room and this I believe was cr parts part of the crown molding. And when I tore it down, it's actually mahogany. So I kept it and I'll strip these two with the paint on them. And you'll see how pretty that that mahogany is underneath this white paint. To reinforce the corners before glue up, I choose to put biscuits in the corners just because I have a biscuit joiner, which makes life easier. So I just cut slots in the corners and add biscuits. Another good method is splines. Um, if you want to cut splines and put in there. So somehow over the years, I've acquired three different um, jigs or clamps for putting together picture frames. I haven't bought any of them. People have given them to me. And this first one is a Veritas four-way speed clamp, and it uses little corner squares and then these these um, threaded rods, but the, the, the nuts that you screw are off-center holes, so you could slide them on the sledded rod and then tighten everything. Um, tightening diagonally in order to get it to fit. This one I don't actually know the manufacturer, but it's kind of an X system and you set those red those red um, corner clamps um, pertaining to the width and the length of your frame and then it's got this center bolt that you tighten and it pulls the whole thing together. The last one is um, a bandage strap clamp. So it's basically um, a ratchet strap that has little plastic corners so you can you can put the corners on all your corners and tighten the strap these are extremely versatile I use them for other things besides picture frames the other two I think are mostly going to be just for picture frames and I was planning on doing somewhat of a review for this but all three of them worked really well so any of those would work 
And if you don't have these, I used to use regular clamps to clamp the picture frames together, and that works as well. It's just I had these because someone gave them to me. And you can see in the photo, some of them, if you tighten them too much, the corners want to lift, so I put clamps in the corners just to keep everything flat. And once they come out of the clamps, I just sand off all of that glue. So you might have noticed when I showed you the rabbit on this one piece of molding that the rabbit was really close to the molding because um, if you're u reclaim, using reclaimed moldings, um, they're a little bit thinner on the edge. So in order to reinforce that, that edge so that it doesn't snap off, I ended up cutting some strips of mahogany and gluing it onto the inside of that piece. And then the two picture frames that were painted, I'm stripping the paint off of all of them. If you want these to be painted, your life is going to be much easier than mine was. I would just um, sand that old paint till it's smooth and you get all the loose stuff off and, and rough up the finish, especially if it's a gloss finish, and you could really paint them any color you want after that. But if you want to strip off the paint, I just use a chemical stripper. Um, on these older frames, sometimes it takes everything off in one go. I think I did a couple for especially this one with all the detail molding and in order to get the paint off once it's once it's set on there as long as it should I usually end up using a wire brush in order to get a lot of that paint off just be careful with the wire brush this frame I'm working on is pine so it will scratch the wood underneath if you're a little too rough the mahogany one the paint came off really quickly this one with all the detail took um, a couple coats so I also wanted to try out multiple finishes on these frames. So for the oak, I went with a darker stain. You could really choose any stain you like. I've noticed most people do not like honey colored stains on oak at all. It's just not in style. So I stuck with darker ones on this. So it was just a light coat of stain. Let it set up on there for about 10, 15 minutes and then wiped it off. Really simple. The, for the mahogany frame, I chose to put oil on it just because mahogany is so pretty um, when it's oiled or clear coated. So this is just teak oil and I ended up putting about four coats on that and I wait a day in between adding coats. And then for the reclaimed molded frame, I chose polyurethane, clear coated polyurethane. Polyurethane is not really my um, finish of choice these days, but I figured it's something most people have laying around and it's not a bad finish at all. So in between um, coats, I put three coats of poly on this frame and you have to lightly sand in between coats in order to get proper adhesion. And then the oak frame as well with the stain, I ended up putting poly on too. So in between coats, I usually sand them with some um, double, not double, uh, four zero steel wool or even some fine grit um, sandpaper. You have to be careful with the steel wool on stuff you've you've taken paint off of because it will get caught in all the nurdles, the, the steel wool wool. And then for the um, oil frame, like I said, I think I put like four coats on and I wait a day in between putting coats on and remember to remove excess oil. And then I don't show in the video, but the finish for this one, I actually put a shellac on. I don't use a lot of shellac because it's not a super durable finish. But it's great for stuff like picture frames because you don't need the finish to be durable because it's hanging on the wall and it dries so quickly. I was able to put on three coats of shellac in, in a day. Before I finish this up, you can kind of see now that this is together how that math works. By subtracting the rabbit and just multiplying the thickness of your board times two, basically what you're doing is you could see if I square up this edge from the edge to the corner, it's going to be the same as the thickness here. So the thickness here is right about three inches, and the thickness from my straight edge to the corner is three inches. So that's why you're adding your thickness three and three, and it will come out just about perfect every single time with that simple formula. So to finish these up, I'm going to be putting some plexiglass in them. Um, I just find that plexiglass doesn't have as nice of a look as glass, but you don't have to worry about it breaking, especially if you're going to be shipping something or giving it to someone. So I just found that inner dimensions of my frame really easily, just measured it, and I could cut plexiglass really easily with a plexiglass cutter in my shop. I have cut this stuff on the table saw. I don't recommend it. 
and this one sheet I think it was 24 by 18 I was able to get two pieces for the frame and it was um, a little less than an eighth inch thick and then once I checked to make sure the plexiglass fits fits I could cut the backer for my frame and I just like to use old cardboard for this so it's, it's an easy way to recycle the excessive amount of packaging that Amazon uses for stuff so I just um, rest that plexiglass in there put my frame uh, picture in there and then for the backer I'm using these little picture buttons and I just have these um, you could order pitch uh, picture frame stuff in bulk on Amazon and it's really cheap and I have some gimlets for putting um, the screws in if you use drills a lot of times it, it can crack your frame so I try and do as much of this by hand as possible and those old prints are kind of nice because a lot of them are double-sided so if you you frame something like this you potentially get two pictures so then I use sawtooth hooks on the top and on these ridged backs you have to make sure you put that sawtooth on a ridge back and they come with with nails in the pack but I like to use screws because I have had experiences where those nails pull out of the sawtooth so you usually have to enlarge the holes just a little bit and then you can put screws in there and that is your finished frame so if you don't want to buy pitcher buttons um, another option is little brads so in this oak one because um, my framing material sits a little farther inside the frame because the oak was thicker than my other two pieces I'm actually just putting little 5 8 inch brads into the corners and that will hold everything in place and then these are just a bunch of photos of those finished frames you could see especially this first one just how nice the grain of that mahogany looks